Today I will be presenting a, a series of talks about uh, language and artificial intelligence applies to applied to health and medical data. Uh, the idea is uh, that since we are doing a challenge around a similar text uh, grouping or classification, uh, we wanted to give you an overview of uh, how language and uh, medical data collapse. So uh, I will be doing the first uh, talk live, uh, but there are also a series of talks by different professionals from different from different fields. So uh, after my talk, you will be able to uh, watch them on YouTube, and we will also be promoting and broadcasting them throughout the hackathon. So uh, first, I, now I will be doing my uh, presentation. I will talk more about the other talks later. Uh, my presentation is about uh, similarity and the importance of negation uncertainty in the context of uh, uh, the challenge looking for similar patients, uh, the AI Dr. House conquers severe, conquers severe COVID-19. So, uh, as you may know, uh, clinical data is very helpful for us, but there is a problem, and that problem is that only 20% of it is structured. Uh, the 80% uh, remaining, remaining information is unstructured, and this, this means that if we want to do something useful with it, we need to be able to convert it to a to an extraction format so uh, people may well people uh, health professionals may use it uh, however we can do this we can do this manually because uh, in for example in the galician health system uh, galicia is, is a region in spain if you are from abroad uh, more than 200,000 clinical nodes are produced every day so that's a lot for someone to go manually through them uh, however, there is a lot of uh, useful information in them, such as uh, uh, COVID-related uh, material that may help us uh, make decisions or may help us with uh, adverse drug uh, surveillance, etc. So our aim is to transform this clinical text into a, a structured representation that may be uh, used by, doctor, by doctors for research or for better treatments, etc. So one way to do this and one of the ways uh, we want to encourage in the in the challenge today uh, this weekend is uh, through semantic textual similarity uh, we can make uh, the process uh, the fact that we have so many uh, different reports uh, easier to treat if we group them uh, by similarity so uh, this uh, technique is called textual similarity and it has many many uses uh, not only in the clinical domain but, but also in other domains we may use it for anonymization, for question answering, uh, for summarization, and in any case, for document clustering and classification. And there are many different ways in which we can uh, perform semantic textual similarity. One of them is uh, knowledge-based methods. Uh, we also can use statistical methods. And uh, another uh, would be a string and sequence comparisons. So uh, one way in which uh, we might want to do this, for example, uh, it's just an idea, is by uh, seeing what kind of concepts appear together and if we, we have the same concept in one document and the same concepts in another, uh, we may say that they are similar. Uh, so for example, if we have dry cough that happens a lot with fever and uh, PCR, we may say that uh, those are uh, COVID-19 uh, reports and put them together. But uh, how do we do this? Well, first, uh, if we want to see what words occur together, we need to find what uh, concepts are there in a document. And this process uh, is called named entity recognition. Uh, here's an example. We have a document and we find uh, which chemicals or which drugs are in the document, which diseases, um, uh, as well as which symptoms. However, is it, is it enough to just uh, find what is mentioned in the text? If uh, we, were, we were to give a doctor this a document and say that uh, a patient has hypertension and uh, nausea and pneumonia and uh, they have diabetes and a COVID-19 infection would it be right? Well, the truth is that uh, just because something is mentioned in the text doesn't mean that it's present. Uh, a lot of times uh, doctors will name something because they couldn't find it in their tests or, or because they had a suspicion and then they could prove that it was wrong or that they, they were right. So, uh, for example, in the example we just saw, uh, many, many uh, entities were negated. So uh, we could also use this, this type of information 
uh, to characterize our patient and uh, try to create a profile for our tech similarity. So now I will focus on uh, two different, uh, well, they are called sometimes extra, proposition, extra propositional meaning because uh, it's a meaning that is in the sentence, but uh, you need some processing to, to detect it. Uh, the first one will be negation. Uh, as you may know, negation indicates that something is absent or that it hasn't happened or just that it isn't true. And uh, everything can be negated. Diseases can be negated, as in the patient shows no signs of COVID-19. And uh, procedures can be negated, as in performing an endoscopy is ruled out. So we don't need a no or a without to have a negation. Uh, verbs can also negate something. And uh, words themselves can be uh, can be negated, like in uh, a febrile upon admission, which is a symptom, and a febrile is a negation per se. So uh, they are, it's, it's actually very re relevant uh, to find this type of information since it's reported that around half of clinical conditions in narrative reports are negated. So it happens uh, quite a lot and we really need uh, to know uh, which symptoms, uh, diseases and procedures uh, are actually happening. Uh, and although historically this field has been studied from many, many perspectives such as uh, philosoph philosophy, uh, mathematics and linguistics, uh, from a computational point of view it uh, has been uh, studied as early as uh, 1994, so around uh, 20, 25 years ago. And another interesting phenomenon is uh, uncertainty or just certainty. Uh, uncertainty indicates that the clinician is, uh, is uh, sure or isn't sure about what they're saying. So, for example, uh, if they say that a patient has uh, symptoms compatible with COVID-19, with COVID uh, we can't say that the patient has COVID-19 for a fact. Or that uh, they have a suspicion of internal hemorrhage, well, the same. And uh, although uh, from the computational point of view, I would say that it's generally less studied than negation, it's still very, very common. And uh, in my opinion, this is because uh, doctors uh, don't want to make blunt don't want to make a blunt statement uh, if they don't have evidence for something. So uh, they can't say that you have COVID nineteen un unless they have a test result that uh, confirms it. For example, so it, it happens quite a lot. And unlike negation, uh, there are various levels or uh, various uh, possibilities in which uh, certainty can happen. Uncertainty can happen. Uh, something can be unlikely, like it's very likely that the patient will recover, or something can be possible, like uh, it could be that the result was a false positive, and can, something can be unlikely, like uh, what we used to say a year ago, that a pandemic seems impossible. Well, uh, now that we know what these phenomena are, uh, let's see how we can detect them. On the one, on one hand, on the one hand, uh, we can classify the entities we detected earlier. We detected earlier. So, for example, uh, we detected uh, a COVID-19 infection, and now uh, what we want to do is uh, classify whether uh, this disease uh, is affirmed or is negated or is an uncertain. So, in this case, it's negated. It's a classification task. Uh, another point of view is to treat this, uh, this type of phenomenon. Uh, from a linguistic point of view. So uh, what we want to do is to find the marker and the scope, uh, which are uh, uh, more syntactic terms, we could say. Uh, the marker is what uh, indicates that something is happening in the sentence, and the scope is the part that is affected. So for example, uh, when we say uh, no one knows me and nor Ayusa, uh, the marker would be no, and the scope would be anosmia nor ayusia. If you don't know what anosmia and ayusia are, it's, uh, I think it's uh, two of the most uh, famous uh, COVID-19 symptoms. Anosmia is when you lo uh, lose your smell, and ayusia is when you lose your taste. Uh, well, the problem with this uh, point of view is that uh, some cases may be harder to define because uh, sometimes there are uh, ellipses, some part of the sentence are omitted. Like uh, if we say the patient can repeat words but not sentences, uh, the part that we think might be negated is sentences, but uh, the verb is also negated because what the patient can't do is repeat sentences. It's not that the patient can't sentences. I don't know if, if uh, you get what I mean. And uh, another possible problem is that sometimes we may have uh, double negations. Uh, 
So as in active bleeding can't be ruled out. Uh, in this case, we have two negations and we have to figure out whether there is an active bleeding going on or uh, whether it, it, in this case it would be uncertain. And another possibility is that uh, we have something that we would consider negation, such as a uh, rule out, but it's actually uh, in a conditional or a hypothesis. So uh, we can we must be careful about what we say is absent because it could be uncertainty. And uh, how do we uh, treat these entities, entities uh, these phenomena, uh, from a computational point of view? What kind of systems can we use to detect them? Well. Uh, I would say that the first uh, type of system that appeared were uh, rule-based systems, uh, which uh, used a lot of uh, rules, obviously, uh, as well as regular expressions. And they have the advantage that you don't really need annotated data to train these systems because you define them. But uh, at the same time, they are harder to generalize to different type of types of texts. And uh, well, obviously, you need to uh, use some time and probably some linguists to define some rules and uh, to write some regular expressions. And uh, the most famous algorithm uh, for negation is called Negex. Uh, it's very famous because uh, since the beginning it has worked uh, very well. And it has been adapted to many, many languages, including Spanish, French, German, and Swedish. But uh, if you look them up in Google, you'll see that there are many, many adaptations even for the same language. And uh, it, it is a system that has been improved over the years, uh, for example, by including syntactic dependencies, which is something that is easy to, uh, is easy to detect using, uh, I don't know, a Python library. Uh, so if you look up Negex, you see that there are many variations. And uh, some of the variations also include uncertainty, which uh, it's something that, from my point of view, is necessary, and even temporality, which is another important aspect in clinical text. And uh, I would like to point out that one of the authors of the Spanish uh, Negex, uh, who is uh, Ernestina Menasalvas, will be doing uh, one of the talks, of the talks uh, that are part of this series. Uh, so next, we have uh, some more advanced AI methods, uh, which is basically machine learning. And uh, what's the problem with this system? Well, we need annotated data. And this is not always easy to come across, especially in the in the clinical domain where there is a lot of problems with uh, privacy and uh, this type of thing. So it's not always easy to have real annotated data. But uh, the advantage is that this type of systems it is supposed to be more versatile. So we could use them, we theoretically could use them for more types of text. And uh, you can uh, train a neural network, but you don't need to do that because classic te techniques has, have also been shown to work, such as uh, classifiers or conditional random fits. And uh, I don't know if you follow the news, uh, if, you've, if you've seen any news ab uh, about uh, NLP, natural language processing, in the past uh, one or two years, you have probably heard about transformers. They are everywhere. And uh, they are also the state of the art in this field. Uh, we have Nechbert, which is BERT for negation, and we have uh, a system based on ExcelNet. Uh, well, both uh, rule-based systems and machine learning systems uh, are evaluated using precision, recall, and F1 score. So I kind of liked when I said earlier that rule-based systems didn't need any type of uh, annotated data because actually you need something to be able to, uh, to see how well your system performs. Uh, and in case you want to uh, learn or train your own uh, machine learning system, uh, here are some uh, labeled data, some labeled corpora that you may use. Uh, as you see, there is uh, a lot of variety from different fields. In English, we have uh, things re related to genes and proteins, or uh, paper abstracts, uh, reports, uh, draft drug interactions. And in Spanish, there's also a great variety. Uh, we have uh, real electronic health records, as well as uh, radiology reports, clinical records. And in other languages, we also ha uh, find that there is less variety, but still there are some, some resources. Uh, if, you like, if you would like to learn more about uh, this data, this uh, corpora, uh, there is a very interesting and complete paper uh, called Corpora Annotated with Negation, an overview, which is uh, from this year. Uh, I would uh, advise you to, 
to look it up if you want to read more about them. And uh, actually, Maria Teresa Martin Valdivia, uh, one of the authors of this paper, will be also presenting one of the presentations that are, that are part of this series. And I'm really happy that she's here because I think she's one of the reference for negation in Spanish. And uh, this uh, paper is not in is not mentioned in their paper because it's newer. Uh, actually, uh, I participated in it, and it's about a corpus of negation and uncertainty with uh, real uh, electronic health records that were anonymized. So uh, I advise you to look them up. So uh, now that uh, you know. Uh, what negation and uncertainty are. Uh, now that you have this information, you may be thinking, okay, so what can I do with, uh, with this information? Well, here are some ideas. Uh, you may try, for example, to compare uh, the uh, signs of symptoms of COVID-19 to uh, other diseases by looking, by checking if uh, the symptoms are similar or different uh, or present or not present. Or you may try to find whether symptoms in general in certain patients are present or absent. Uh, you may also try to do what's called differential diagnosis, which is also to compare uh, whether uh, certain pathologies uh, are uh, similar or different to each other. And you may also try to maybe create some profiles like uh, pedi pediatric patients versus uh, adult uh, patients or uh, female uh, patients versus uh, male uh, patients. Uh, another possibility is to uh, see whether there is some type, some type of travel behavior, like, I don't know, uh, the patient traveled in March uh, 2020 to Milan, which uh, I think was one of the first uh, foci in, in Europe. Or uh, another possibility is to try to use negation uh, to find out uh, which uh, COVID-19 patients uh, didn't have no symptoms, so they were asymptomatic. Uh, and what are their characteristics uh, related to symptomatic uh, patient, patients? So, uh, that was my talk. Uh, I hope you got some ideas. Uh, remember that you can download the, the data for the challenge in Zenodo. It's also in, in Discord, the link is there. And here is the bibliography if you want to check some of the, of the articles I mentioned. Uh, here's the second part. Don't worry if you don't get it because this uh, talk will be on Twitch as well as on YouTube, so we you will be able to stop it. And uh, here are some resources. Uh, and uh, I would like to say a bit more about the rest of the presentations to finish. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to thank the speakers because uh, they did a great job in a really sh uh, short notice. And we have a great variety of speakers from different centers, and we have like uh, clinical perspectives uh, from doctors, and we also have uh, researchers from uh, different uh, backgrounds. So uh, the idea is to give you a, a general overview of the of how language and health data relate to each other. So you can, uh, if you have any doubts, uh, you can like build a picture in your mind. Uh, we have some talks that are about the clinical perspective, as I just said, and also about the uh, artificial intelligence and LP applications, uh, like uh, from the perspective of data science, as well as for, uh, from resources and terminologies, which might also be really helpful, especially in medicine. And if you want to check them out, here is our YouTube channel. I will share it now on Discord also, and I will give a brief des description of each of the, each of the talks. Well, uh, that was it. Uh, and well, remember if, uh, if you like our talks, uh, subscribe to our channel and push the like button. And uh, I would also like to finish by thanking uh, all the participants as well as the uh, uh, organizers of the hackathon for their hard work. And remember to donate. Uh, now I will go to the uh, question part. I would like to check the chat. So if you have any, any questions, I would be happy to hear them. Could you also share the YouTube channel here? Yes, I will do it uh, in the Discord channel because I, I, I think I don't have a Twitch account. <laughs> uh, I can participate in the challenge, but I've learned a lot about Python and the lips. Good job, guys. Thank you. No se más lejos de nada, pues vale. Uh, I don't know if the, the chat is familiar because I don't see many questions, but uh, if you have any other questions, uh, please uh, join our Discord. 
and I will be happy to help you. If you have any questions, not only about my talk, but about uh, any of the other talks, you can also go to the to the YouTube channel and put some comments underneath and uh, we will ask the speakers to answer you. Okay, so that was all. Uh, I hope you liked the presentation. Uh, thank you for everything. Uh, good night and see you this weekend.